it kind of started off from the English Civil War, uh, which was in the 18, sorry, 1640s. So this is how bad my history is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, okay. Um, it started with the, the new model army, which was Oliver Cromwell's army that he used to de defeat the royalists at the time. Uh, and the, the way this army kind of worked uh, was not like previous armies, where it was just literally do what you're told, march. The new model army encouraged intelligence in, in the officers and uh, kind of encouraged a more democratic system within the army to help them organize their battles. Um, and that's what made them the most powerful army in the country and helped them take over the country. Um, but then in, in 1648, this, the new model army sort of started dividing and there was a group called the Levelers who, who were all soldiers. Uh, but they, they didn't necessarily agree with all of what Oliver Cromwell was trying to do. They wanted something completely more radical. Um, they, they wanted uh, le levelling inequality. Uh, they wanted um, the abolition of the House of Lords. They wanted us these days. Um, but they, they were crushed. The levellers were sort of basically attacked by the, the army and defeated um, in 1649. And that's about the time when the diggers came around, that they were sort of the same idea. Um, but they actually had the idea of going onto bits of uh, common land, or what had been common land, and just literally living there. Um, they, they obviously had a lot of political ideas, but what, what they did was very simple. It was just... Um, Okay, I'll start talking, first of all, a bit about what, um, what I understand about Gerard Wynne Stanley, the guy who sort of led the diggers and where he came from, because I think that explains a bit about what gave them the ideas. Uh, Gerard Wynne Stanley was a very sort of middle class kind of upbringing. Uh, it was what, what they called then petty bourgeois, as in he was not rich, but he was very well educated. And I think there were quite a few people at that time who were in that bracket who were well educated enough to understand what was going on, what was going wrong. Uh, they just didn't have the, the kind of jobs that they actually wanted to do available, which is quite similar to the situation these days, I think. And I'm just going to read a little quote from uh, Gerard Wynne Stanley, uh, what he experienced when he first came to London. Uh, yeah, okay, he was born in Wigan, and he came to London to look for work when he was, I guess, in his early 20s or something like that. Um, by their cheating sons in the thieving art of buying and selling, and by the burdens of, and for the soldiery in the beginning of the war, he had been beaten out of both estate and trade, and had been forced to accept the goodwill of friends crediting of me to live a country life. What he means by being beaten out of both estate and trade, I think it means he, he basically tried to get a job in London as whatever tradesman, merchant or whatever, and he just couldn't handle it. He didn't like the art of buying and selling, and he wound up kind of uh, on, on the scrap heap of life, so to speak, as in he, uh, he'd been well, well brought up and well educated, but he couldn't really find something that he could do that was uh, satisfying, um, uh, as work-wise, which I think a lot of us are in that situation these days. Um, but he, he was also um, a devout uh, Christian, uh, well, he sort of, he sort of, um, he, had, he had his own ideas, but it, it was under the Christian faith, and it was in, in the name of God the things that they were doing at the time. Um,
So yeah, all of the, the sort of pamphlets that they printed at the time were were about um, this this idea that uh, God gave everybody the earth, and so that the idea of holding property is a sin against God, um, which I, I think I, I can relate to that, even though I'm not really religious. Um, Okay, so I'll carry on a bit more about history and then I'll start talking about today. <laughs> um, so what, what, what happened was they, this, this group sort of formed in, in uh, Surrey on St George's Hill um, and they did it very quietly. It, was, it wasn't for a while that the, um, the government at the time actually found out they were there because all they did was they went, they got together uh, we, we don't know exactly how. I've tried to look into sort of how they got together, but it's all very shady because we've only got reports from uh, the government at the time uh, what, what they had to say about them. Uh, but what they, they didn't make a big deal about what they were doing. They just they went onto a piece of common land or what they believed to be common land, uh, and they just started planting things. They didn't live there for the first few weeks by the sound of it. They just basically planted their crops and then later they moved in and started living there. Um, they met with mostly problems from the local people by the sound of it. Some of the local people came and trashed their crops, um, knocked down their houses just because they were like, these people can't just come and live on the land. Why, why, why can't we do that if they can do that? It's not fair. Um, and the actual the government didn't really intervene for quite a while until they did eventually send uh, men on horses to come and drive them out of the place but they lasted about a year which is quite amazing they, they stayed there for a year and they, they grew enough food to actually um, share food with the local community and that's how they won a lot of support um, they, they, they did get kicked out eventually and they wound up going into different little factions around the country, little diggers communities um, but they gradually got smaller and smaller and I guess they turned into something else or just disappeared or got old um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know that much about the history so that's where I'm going to end that unless anyone wants to Ask any questions about the history. Well, he 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 was a breacher, um, but he later became a police constable. But I don't think that means quite the same thing that it does today. I think to be a police constable was more like a local Bobby kind of job than it is to these days. So I think he was a well-respected well sort of part of the local community. And uh, he, he, carri he carried on preach preaching, he carried on writing these pamphlets. Um, the, the, the other fellow, Evard, who, who um, doesn't get mentioned that much in the diggers, he might have died. At least that's what, it, that's what I found in my research. Um, so he... he probably didn't carry on to do anything else and the rest of them probably kind of split up into different groups um, right okay so I'll, I'll go on to uh, modern day diggers and I mean I, I didn't know anything about the diggers until a few years ago because I, I'm not really a historian um, but I was wandering through a bit of land in West London uh, a few years ago, and I saw. Well, I, I heard there was a, a bunch of people living on some land, so I thought I'd go and investigate to see what was going on. And there was a big sign outside saying, The land is yours, come in. And so I wandered in there, and I, I saw a load of people living in tents. And I thought, Oh, it's a protest site, they're protesting against something. And I asked them about this, and I was like, Oh, how, how long do you think you'll last here? And I thought, oh, yeah, maybe they'll be there a few weeks or something. But it turned out they weren't protesting about anything. 
They didn't want anything. They just wanted land. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was, I was quite amazed by that whole concept. They, they weren't protesting for higher wages. They weren't protesting for better working conditions. They weren't protesting anything particularly. They weren't even protesting against the war, although obviously most of them were probably against the war. But that, uh, the, the basic stated intention was that they wanted to take the land. Um, and yeah, I, I wound up going to live there for a while. And I wasn't involved in the, the political side of it, but I did enjoy the, the lifestyle. Of, of living on a bit of land, building your own home, growing your own food. Um, there's, there's something about that that in normal life you don't experience, and when you do experience it, it's quite a revelation, I think. Um, but yeah, since then I've been, I've been involved with uh, this, this group of people who have been sort of going around finding bits of land and just setting up villages on them. And it's quite um, interesting what's happened. Um, in June this, July this year, we started a new eco-village in Windsor, uh, which we've called the Diggers 2012 camp. <laughs> and it's still going now. Uh, we've, we've built a sort of Anglo-Saxon style longhouse, which is a bit taller than this building, maybe from there over to there, which is our communal dwelling. Uh, we, and we've all built separate structures around in the woods, like tree houses. Uh, I've built a hole underground. Um, other people have built various crazy structures. But it's, it's all kind of in the, in the name of just experience. We're, we're, not, we're not making... We're not, we're not trying to sell ourselves to anyone. We're just trying to experience what, what we want to do, really. And, um, I think that's been, that's been quite powerful when we've had, we've had police and bailiffs come and uh, with, with protest camps, the, the sort of the relationship between the, the people protesting or whatever and the police or the bailiffs is usually just friction, awkwardness, secrecy, things like this and I think what, what's amazed me about what we've been doing at Windsor is there's been none of that secrecy, none of that um, deception going on between us and the police or the, or the bailiffs because we're just completely blatant about what we're doing, we're not trying to hide, we're not digging tunnels, we're not making defences. Um, and when the, when the police have come initially, uh, obviously they were just doing their jobs, they just had to come and tell us you're not supposed to be here, get off this bit of land, it's somebody else's, it's not yours. Um, but after the first week or so of the police coming pretty much every day, um, they started sitting down and having tea with us. Um, and then a few days later, they actually came along with a bag of tea, coffee, sugar to donate to the camp. And this is, this is police officers on, doing their duty. And um, then the, the next night, they came and they had dinner with us. They actually ate off a plate with us. Um, some of our hippie gruel that we cooked up, and they, they, uh, they were very complimentary of it. Um, and I think it's, it's the fact that we treated them as human beings initially, and not as police officers. And th uh, that's very difficult, because when you see a uniform, you, s you see like impending doom, you say, no, we're going to lose our homes. Uh, but it's best really to, I think at the moment, there's a lot of police officers out there who were sort of having a slight change of heart about what, what, um, what they're doing. And I think that the police officers who come to visit us are a lot like that because they want to sit down and talk. They want to talk about what we're doing and they're really interested in it uh, personally. Nothing to do with their jobs. Um, so yeah, that, that's really good. And I've never seen anything like that in, in protest camps before. And I think that's a great thing. Um. I've got a question. Yeah. Is it, is it right that you're um, a couple of fields away from where the Magna Carta was signed? 
That's correct. Yeah, and that's where that's where we um, we're, every Saturday uh, we're holding meetings at the Magna Carta Memorial uh, about land rights, <laughs> uh, and that, that's that's quite fun because it, it's a, it's a beautiful memorial. It's like an American-built memorial to the Magna Carta. It says "Freedom Under Law" in big letters, and that's where we go to have our meetings. Um, yeah. A radio mic. <laughs> Can't hear you from there. I think that, that's really inspiring what you're saying, and um, I can't believe you lived just down the road from you. We're on a boat in the in the river, and living on a boat, you don't have any outside space. So we'd love to come and see you and say hello and see what you're doing. Please do. Yeah, yeah. No, not, not many people know where we are for, for the fact that we don't make a big deal of it. Basically, we're just. I mean, never, never. I mean, we've been there for ages and never heard of that going on near, right near us. So that'd be great to see, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I don't have any flyers with me, but I, I can give. Um, I can draw maps for anyone who wants to find where we are, or I can just give you the website address, and that's got a Google map on it. What is the website? Can, you, right, okay. um, can we have the website? For uh, it's diggers2012.wordpress.com. Thanks. What sort, of, what sort of questions do the police ask? I mean, what are they interested in? You said it's not to do with their, you know, in the line of duty. There's some kind of other interest they have. Well, I'm, I'm interested because, I mean, that was part of the whole student thing, was a student saying, you're next, right? Which is what's happened. So I wonder now that they've maybe twigged. I wonder what sort of things they are more interested in now. Uh, well, every, every time they come, they, they, they come with their standard questions. How many of you are there? Um, when are you going to leave? But they've, they, uh, once they've got that out of the way, they usually ask us more kind of, political questions. They don't, they don't just ask questions. They talk to us about the news. They tell us what's happening in Syria and Libya. Because they, they, they watch TV. We don't watch TV. So they keep us up to date with the news. And they have their opinions on these things the same as we do. And most of them are in line. Um, what they also like talking about is the, the practical aspects of our way of life. They're very interested in the way that we've built our houses and the way that we're trying to grow food. Um, we're, we're doing a bit of forestry as well. We're, sort of, we're, we're in a woodland and we're chopping down trees. We've got a big two-man saw chopping down trees to make way for agriculture. Um, and yeah, they're really into that kind of practical, uh, manly activities. <laughs> The landowner is a, a large housing developer who we've tried to contact, but they're such a big organisation, it's virtually impossible. It, it, sounds like, uh, it sounds like you're, you've got an ideology around low impact or sustainable living. Is that that's all part and parcel of what Diggers 2012 is about? That, that, come, that comes into it, yeah. I think... Um, a lot of different people come into this kind of way of life for different reasons. Some people come from the, the, the green movement, people who want to live more sustainably and uh, do less damage to the planet. Some people uh, come from all different angles. Per personally, I was just looking for a different lifestyle, something a bit more satisfying. Um, and then I'm, I'm not, I've never been that bothered about climate change and things like that. Uh. <laughs> well, I've got a question myself, actually, which I'll ask uh, on the way over to this gentleman. Uh, um, I've been reading that the, the, there's a new demographic group uh, uh, which is known as the Graduate with No Future. I mean, do you see yourselves as part of it, uh, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I meant to talk, say, say a bit more about that because that's. I mean, from reading about Gerald Wynne Stanley, he, he kind of fit at that bracket. He was over-educated, um, and the, the kind of jobs he was finding in the city were, were not satisfactory. They weren't stimulating enough for him. It was just numbers, you know, uh, working in advocates or something to, to make money. 
and that's just not satisfying for some of us, I think. Yeah, do you see what you're doing as like a retreat away from modern, the modern way of living? And I mean, because I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's all well and good to do that, but actually the real issues aren't being addressed and there are going to be fundamental issues that will need to be addressed in this country, which would, which would probably involve mass uh, movement developing, really. And I'm just wondering, do you, how do you see what you're doing in relation to a wider, a wider move towards a more, more sustainable, equal, just society? Because at the moment, I mean, you're just there because they're allowing you to be there. I, mean, I would be very dubious of the police uh, they'll be friendly at the moment, but you know they. I, w I wouldn't be surprised if, when push comes to shove, they're quite, you know, they're quite happy to evict you from that space. You know, they're still they're still representing. You know, your this sort of way of living that you're doing to continue. That is your access to land and common access. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. How tenuous you feel it is, really, and what what you would like, what you think. Is it a bit part of a bigger idea, or are you just retreating away from what's going on? Um, That's not criticism either. I'm not, I don't mean that as a criticism. The different people within the group have different ideas about land, about how land could be allocated or should be allocated to, to bring about more equality. Um, there's, lo there's lots of ideas that could, could be brought in to, by the government, things like land value tax and things like this. But um, yeah, I think such such a, a small movement as it is at the moment, uh, the the kind of demands that we might ask for will never be met. But then the demands that the diggers made were never met. But they made the demands, and that's the point, I think. Um, and the, the the point that we're trying to make, if we're trying to make any point by being there, is that land is the most valuable thing. Um, even though the, the, the kind of groups that are campaigning for fairer working conditions, better pay for people, uh, benefits, things like this, they're perfectly uh, genuine. But what we're trying to say is, and if we can't have a bit of land and uh, sort of just be left alone, then uh, we don't really have any freedom. I mean, it's more a comment, really, just to pick up on that point, is that uh, this afternoon I'm actually doing a common law workshop about common law and land rights. And we don't necessarily need a mass movement to do these things. What we need to be able to do is take the land securely, but also help other people get out of the system, what I call Babylon, basically. And what I've come up with in the common law is a, a letter that's so far proved foolproof for things like getting rid of uh, credit card debts, not paying council tax, not paying parking fines. It's worked very well. What I'm looking for at the moment is someone who's got a mortgage who is prepared to do this letter for the mortgage, basically. Because the only language that system understands is money coming in. So if you start to encourage people not to pay their mortgages through a lawful route, that is how you'll bring that system down. So it doesn't require a mass organisation, it requires more people sharing a philosophy, essentially. The only thing you can really unite under it is love. Uh, obviously, I know Andrew very well, um, and I would... If they wanted me to, I'd be very happy to... I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to go do the common law stuff there, basically. <laughs> so thank you. Just a thought on your growing food. Um, do, is it possible to, in the amount of land you've got, to be like self-sufficient, have that kind of Seymour-type ideology, or do you still need to rely on going to Tesco or wherever you go, I don't know, but is it, is it self-sufficient or do you need...? Um, we have more than enough land, definitely. We've got, I, I, don't, I haven't even worked out how many acres, but it's probably over 200 acres of land that we're actually squatting. And some of it's woodland, some of it's pasture. Um, obviously, we'd need, we'd need a, a longer term to, to actually get self-sufficient. Um, so that I mean that's that's kind of that's an experience ra rather than the sort of 
definite plan. It's, it's, it's about try, trying to grow your own food. Um, because a lot of us are sort of just starting out on that kind of idea. So, uh, well, I, I have a question. Oh. Um, something you'll find often thrown out on the sort of uh, comment threads on The Guardian about Occupy and different things is like, well, they're still happy to use their iPhones and all the rest of it. Do you ever get that? And what's your attitude to it? Um. We get a bit of that, yeah. Not not too much because we, um, I mean, we don't have any signal where we are. We don't. <laughs> we don't have any electricity. So it's it's like uh, if if anyone can get any signal on their phone, it's like fought over. Can I can I just ask again? Um, it's me over here again. The hat. Um, can I just ask? How did you find this this land? How did you identify this land that you and and how long have you been there? Uh, oh, yeah, that's something I should have, I should have um, talked about a bit earlier, is how, has, uh, how to find land if you want to find land to uh, occupy. And find it's, it's a question of also about how you communicate with, between each other. You know, how does your group sort of decide to make decisions and stuff? Um, but anyway, answer the first bit first. Uh, <laughs> okay, sneaking in lots of questions. Uh, there's, there's a number of ways you can go about finding land. You can just go out and look for it, walking or cycling or driving, um, and see a bit of land that looks like it hasn't been used. Um, and then the, the way to find out about the history of the land, you can, you can pay £4 on the National Land Registry website to find out the, the whole title deed of any bit of land. Um, but if you were to go through lots of bits of land and do that, that would work out quite expensive. Um, so what, what we usually tend to do is just, uh, first of all, do a Google search for the address of the piece of land or the description of the piece of land. Uh, so we can find out any newspaper articles saying whether it's been bought or sold recently, whether it's likely to be developed, whether it's um, anything's happening. Uh, then you can go on the local planning permission uh, website for the local council and you can look it up on there and find out something about the history of it. Um, or you can just go and squat a piece of land and then find out later. <laughs> We've been there about three months. Uh, but over the, over the last three or four years, um, we, um, I, I've been living entirely in squatted eco-villages. Um, usually they last around a year, something like that. Sorry to keep asking you these questions, it probably, uh, but when you, if you manage to, to squat on the land, which is how they would see it, rather, you're taking the land and you're there, is there like, is there still the kind of uh, squatter's rights that if you're there for so long, you actually have the land or all that sort of stuff? or? Do you, know, do you know about this? I mean, what, what are your rights as squatters? Because uh, I had heard that they're trying to change all whatever laws there are anyway about squatting. Isn't there? Um, I, I don't know uh, in, enough about that, to be honest. I, I don't know about the 12 year law or anything like that. Yeah, they, they have recently made squatting domestic accommodation a criminal offence, basically. Uh, but that doesn't apply to land. But under the Babylonian law, if you keep somewhere for 12 years, it's yours. But under the common law, you take some land and you start to use it for yourself, it's yours, so don't bother with that. <laughs> and so I can show people the paperwork to do this, basically. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, I'm doing a talk at four o'clock this afternoon in the rainbow space, which is in the next field over there. And uh, that'll be about four o'clock, so if you want to come along and find out how to get rid of debts and how to keep land uh, lawfully. I'm David Shaler. Any more? Any more for any more? I think she was asking questions. I just want to know how many of you there are. Uh, that's what the police always want to know. <laughs> um, uh, we usually say there's a thousand waiting up in the woods. <laughs> but there's actually, there's actually, it, it varies. It's, it's the, the minimum is usually around 10, but it, it, it goes up when there's nice weather. <laughs>
How much? I mean, you 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 were kind of noticeably more relaxed when you weren't doing the whole history spiel, and I I I, I wondered how much the diggers precedent matters to most of the people there. It to some of us more than others, uh, because I think um, the, the the diggers had a very very simple kind of plan, um, and a, and a very sort of basic and honest way of dealing with the authorities and I think we've tried to keep that going as in just being absolutely blatant and open about everything that we're doing and not um, trying to be secretive saying yeah which is I think what the diggers kind of did but does it and you think that's a general thing most of the people there would share that thing and relate it to the diggers particularly rather than have it as a kind of a general philosophy that they might have picked up wherever um, no I think it's more of a general philosophy yeah. I, I, I mean mo most of us we don't, we don't know that much about history I don't know that much about history but I mean I've, I've started looking into it since I've been living this kind of lifestyle because it, it's sort of appropriate to find out about how people have done it in the past I just wanted to find out what about water. I mean, you know, we, what do you do for fresh water? Uh, there's there's a, a tap that's just up nearby, and the, there is a spring, but it's not very clean, so we just use tap water. So are, are you? I mean, you know, it's interesting. Are you? My friends who've squatted before, sometimes they're paying the electric bill, they're paying the water, so that the water and electric don't get turned off to the building. So are you occupying an area which is paying water rates, or how do, or is it just happening that the taps are on? How does it work? Um, the, the tap belongs to the university, which is the land that we're on. It's an abandoned university. Um, and the security guard who is in charge of keeping us out of the university buildings is quite happy for us to use the water as long as we stay out of the buildings, I think. I just wondered if you've had any engagement with like, the local community. If there, I don't know where you are, so I don't know if there is really a local community, but have you had, what engagement have you had with the wider public? Have people come, you know, I'm not talking about people who know what you're doing or into what this, what you do, but people who just randomly come across you, or you know, just the general public, really. What yeah, we, we we have had. Um, I mean, every day there are a few dog walkers who who come by. Uh, people just out rambling. It's it's a nice bit of countryside, so people come and want to just go for a walk and see some nature. And then uh, the, the 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 response is generally positive. As in, they're they're impressed at what we've built and and what we've what we've done, um, and the, the fact that we've sort of survived there through a summer of rain and mud and all sorts. self-sufficient and get away from this terrible way of living all the cars and God knows what, yeah? And so you get away from it and you create your commune, but the problem is for it to be independent and self-sufficient, but the problem is is that it's not to be dependent on anybody else, but self-sufficient yourself, dependent on only yourself, yeah? So you were talking about the water hoses that go over there, over there. And you would say, well, use the tap. It's a tiny example. They use the tap from the local university, yeah? So it's a tiny thing, but like iPhones and all these other things. So someone's got to pay for that water. So you're not, you haven't got the water yourself, so you're actually dependent on somebody else. So how do you address that problem where you do not be dependent on someone else, but you're self-sufficient, but still somehow you have to be, you depend on someone else to provide that water for you? Yeah, no, completely. We're not, we're not self-sufficient, and we're not anywhere near being self-sufficient. Um, it's it's um, a sort of uh, an, an ideal rather than an instant thing. Um, 
we, we, we buy food from the supermarket, we get food out of bins, we get all sorts of things from, we've got solar panels that we bought off eBay. You know, <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not self-sufficient by any means. It's, uh, like, like I was saying, it's more to do with um, ex experiencing a sort of, uh, uh, the, the experience of being free and living on the land. Um, and it's, if, if, you, if you grew up in a house and, and went to school and had a job or whatever, it's, di it's difficult to try and uh, re, re educate yourself. And um, obviously, there are, there are ways of purifying water, um, the, and there are, we could easily grow enough food for ourselves. And it's, a, it's an ongoing learning process, and it, it's, it's very interesting to, to find out about these things. But we don't make any pretense to be experienced uh, subsistence farmers or anything like this. We're just townies, basically. So. Yeah, I just think it's a fantastic step in the right direction. It's a matter of breaking down the walls, and you can't do it all in one go. So it's really good. Um, which leads on to a question from me. Have you um, contemplated any steps to engage with the, the local community, the people that live there, apart from the plots, of course? There, there isn't um, a town or village that close by. We're sort of deep in the countryside. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a few houses around us. Um, we, we haven't made a, a great attempt to go into the local towns and publicise ourselves because that's not exactly the, the idea. That, um, I think you can often put a lot of energy into trying to publicise things and then you kind of don't have enough energy left to actually do the things. Um, and I think once we've kind of re refined that, sorted out our act a bit and um, really got the community going uh, within, within our little community, then we, then we can go and publicise and say, look, come and see what we're doing. Uh, obviously, we, we invite anyone who wants to come already, um, but we're, we're not going to go out of our way to try and raise a, raise a sort of army or anything like that. Just make a point about the water. Obviously, this country's got a very high water table, so there's lots of natural springs and ancient wells and all sorts of things to get your water out of. So it's not a particular problem in this country, and I imagine around where you are, there will be natural springs. You just haven't found them yet. And there is a website, apparently, and I can't remember the address of it, that actually lists all the natural springs and wells in Britain. So getting water is not a problem. And obviously, drinking spring water is perfect for a human being. The stuff that goes to the taps, it's been... It's had all the goodness taken out of it. It's had crap put in it. So don't touch it, basically. Go to a spring if you can. Well, in my experience of living outdoors is if you dig a seat or a spring, then it's good to get it tested for runoff from local agriculture, which is what we did. Luckily, ours was okay in one of them, but a couple of the others weren't. Anybody else? Uh, the people are talking about the local community. You said that you've been running some um, uh, meetings on land rights where the Magna Carta was signed. Like, and that, I think that that probably counts as, as outreach. <laughs> yeah, that's that's our one day a week of outreach. Yeah. yeah. So um, and and yeah, I think it's really wonderful. You know, just uh, establishing your right to access the land. I think because, like you say, a lot of people they don't have the freedom to do that, and actually just yeah. Sorry, that's not really a question, is it? <laughs> um. I think it's also, I think it's great that you're doing that in an area that's surrounded by royal parks. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that whole area of Windsor is, is just, so, there's so much land there that's owned by the Queen. And it's just loads of, it's a wonderful place to actually do that and make that point just by, in it a very is, humble way. And very, you're, you show great honesty and humility in the way you talk about this. And I think that's one of your, Enormous strengths, actually. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece of countryside, um, and there's a lot of National Trust land around there, and the, the Royal Park. It's a huge area of beautiful countryside just outside London, and it's kind of like this special place um, that people come to get away from the city and go walking and sit in the woods and uh, relax. Um, and Occasionally we've had experiences of people coming along there and seeing us there and I think just being jealous of us basically <laughs> and, and saying look there's all this, you've got this massive great big piece of beautiful countryside 
You shouldn't be going there and living there and spoiling it. You should, you should be living in cities, in, in houses, you know, what you're doing in the woods. Um, you should leave it for badgers and foxes. Um, but uh, that, that sort of brings up a whole other debate which uh, is interesting about National Trust and the Woodlands uh, Trust and the Forestry Commission and all the land that they own that uh, basically is suitable for people to live on. It's just considered as protected from humans because humans are a dangerous species who will go and destroy it um, at what, uh, just by nature, that's just what we do, we destroy nature. Um, but with, with all this land, we, we could literally take people out of the cities and literally just have everyone just living out on the land and spread it all out. Uh, but that, that would make agriculture less efficient according to the sort of um, rationale used by the, the people working the planning permission system. Um, yeah, <laughs> I th but I, I think basically if, if you go and live in, in the woods and you, you sort of get used to it, you won't do any harm because I think humans have to be in the woods. I think the woods need the humans as much as we need the woods, really. Um, the, the National Trust and the Forestry Commission have to actually manage land uh, to, to keep it kind of as it should be. They have to, they have to coppice, uh, they have to chop down larger trees, they have to get rid of the dead wood. Uh, trees that are falling down slightly, they have to chop them down and get rid of them so it's safe which are things that would be happening if people were just living in the woods. They'd be coppicing, they'd be doing this. Um, they'd be controlling the deer that would eat the young saplings of young trees. Um, so it, it just seems to me really ridiculous that, the, that these organisations are spending so much money on um, managing woodlands, which doesn't need to be managed, just needs to be lived in. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> no, sorry, the, the, he was just saying that if, if everyone went to the woods, the woods would be full of people. Yeah, and that's true, and then it would become a less appealing place to be, and then we'd go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but Simon Fairley, when he writes about planning laws, he, he, he does point out that the positive side is it stopped the country turning into a Californian suburb with a sprawl. So, you know, they, 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 I think it probably <laughs> is a positive effect somewhere. Um, anyway, there's a lady here with a can I just ask about um, money? Like, how do you? Presumably, you still need money. You say you know you get stuff from supermarkets and stuff. So, do people manage to work while they're living in your community, or what? How do you? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people. Um, well, a few a few people have part time jobs. Um, I wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't fancy working full time. I don't think anyone really works full time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have you discovered how little you can get by on when you're not paying rent? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the shocking thing. Um, I was just wondering what the, the biggest practical challenges you've come across have been. Like you've obviously been building things, but whether it's been the food or the access to... Yeah, what the practical challenges are. Yeah, the, the practical challenge... Um, wa water is a, is a main practical challenge um, and ar arranging a system whereby you can keep yourself clean and your clothes clean uh, without, without too much effort that's, that's a practical nightmare <laughs> Thank you very much uh, a big round of applause for the <laughs> Well, this really is a, a radical conference because we, it's, most conferences overrun, whereas we're underrunning. We're what's happening there? So, <laughs> I, I, what listening to these two talks, Mike's talk earlier and Andy's talk, it seems to me that sort of one of the biggest things that, that ever happened to this country, probably the most 
shocking thing that we really aren't resilient to because our, our whole fucked up system is our lack of resilience is the loss of land. When, when the enclosures happened, when the land was taken away from all of us, that is the thing that has really, really knocked us as people. And of course, all they did to us was stick us in factories or, or make us go and live in slums or in huge built up areas. So anti-human ways of living. I personally wouldn't mind seeing lots of people living in, in the woods. I, I think it sounds like a lovely place to live. And I think the woods would survive it as well because I, I believe Andy's right. I believe that nature needs human beings. That's why we're here in the first place. We're part of the system that makes nature work. It's just we've been taken away from that system by very strange ideology that we're still trying to find a remedy to.